Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. Welcome to Staff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. And as this comes out, uh, it will be July 1st, 2024, mm-hmm. uh, which is the first day of Disability Pride Month. So we wanted to kick that off with just some statistics. Um, I'm sure we'll have more topics to discuss, but I just wanted to look into it because I don't know that we've ever, we've done episodes on Disability Pride and Disability, obviously, but I wasn't sure what the current state of statistics were. So I wanted to talk about that. With that, content warning for domestic violence, rape, sexual assault, and eugenics. We're not going to get too in-depth into any of those things, but that is a part of the statistics, unfortunately. Um, So here we go. Uh, From UN Women, it is estimated that one in five women live with a disability. Women with disabilities experience various types of impairments, including physical, psychological, intellectual, and sensory conditions that may or may not come with functional limitations. In addition, the diversity of women with disabilities includes those with multiple and intersecting identities across all contexts, such as ethnic, religious, and racial backgrounds, their status as refugee, migrant, asylum-seeking, and internally displaced women, LGBTIQ plus identity, age, marital status, and living with or being affected by HIV. From the CDC, quote, about 36 million women in the U.S. have disabilities, and the number is growing. About 44% of those aged 65 years or older are living with disability. The most common cause of disability for women is arthritis or rheumatism. So I think um, something to keep in mind with a lot of these statistics is we have talked a lot about just in general, how women and marginalized people are not always taken seriously uh, as patients when they come in with things. Um, And that has led to really long delays in getting something diagnosed. It's also led to potentially death. But also on top of that, unfortunately, we're seeing in a lot of countries, not just the U.S., a kind of slashing of um, healthcare. And a lot of that centers around disability. So from now, quote, women with disabilities are particularly disadvantaged when it comes to wage equality. In 2022, women who are disabled made 72 cents for every dollar paid to a man who is disabled. Compared to the non-disabled community, women with disabilities made 68 cents to every dollar earned to able-bodied men. If an individual from this community is seeking employment, the current hiring rate of women with disabilities between the ages of 16 to 64 stands at 37%. Throughout the employment process, women can face challenges ranging from organizational readiness and inclusivity to accessible employment processes and workplace inclusivity provisions. And here's another one uh, from American Progress. According to the Centers for Disease Control, and prevention, the CDC, disability affects one in four Black people in the United States. However, getting a clear picture of what it's like to live with a disability or as a person of color can be difficult due in large part to the fact that data collection on these issues is limited and inconsistent. The data that are available show African Americans are more likely to have a disability than white people, as well as that the disability appears to have greater impacts on them. Both Black people and disabled people face barriers to education and employment that limit their earning potential. According to the National Disability Institute, people with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty than people without disabilities, and nearly 40% of African Americans with disabilities live in poverty. Even after adjusting for education levels, disabled African Americans are more likely to live in poverty than other people with disabilities. So. There's the economic impact, but then there's something else we've also talked about before, which is the sexual violence, domestic violence impact that intersects with disability. Uh, So going back to now, quote, about one in four women have experienced contact, sexual violence, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. 
Research has shown that women with disability are more likely to experience intimate partner violence than those without a disability. In fact, researchers found that compared to women without a disability, women with a disability were significantly more likely to report experiencing each form of intimate partner violence measured, which includes rape, sexual violence, other than rape, physical violence, stalking, psychological aggression, and control of reproductive or sexual health. And here's a quote from The Who, uh, the World Health Organization. One systematic review found greater risk of intimate partner violence for women with disabilities compared with those without, while another also found higher rates of sexual violence. So that brings us to the intersection of reproductive rights and disability. And obviously there's a lot of turmoil around (laughs) reproductive rights in the United States right now and in a lot of countries right now. Um, As always, listeners, if you can write in what's going on in your area, uh, we would love to hear from you because it is, (laughs) it's a lot happening very quickly, it feels like. But here is a quote from American Progress. Reproductive and disability justice are both human rights-based frameworks that, at their core, share fundamental similarities. They both prioritize the right to bodily autonomy and self-determination, the right to raise children if one chooses to have them with dignity and in a safe environment, the right to access the health care one needs, free from political interference or stigmatization, and the right to community care. Yet even with such overlaps, the reproductive justice and disability justice movements have rarely interacted due to misunderstanding and miscommunication, particularly around abortion. Through the leadership of LGBTQ, Black, and Indigenous activists and visionaries, reproductive and disability justice communities are reframing the conversation to be more inclusive of multi-marginalized individuals. Exploring the intersection of the disability and reproductive justice communities is not only necessary to better understand how current societal structures hinder or restrict people with disabilities from making reproductive health decisions that are right for them, but also what policy solutions must be crafted in order to ensure reproductive justice is a reality for all. And then now goes on to go into, yes, the the fact that abortion care is being restricted or banned in several states and that for women with a disability, pregnancy um, or the ability to access abortions can be very life or death. It's, it's not like necessarily a choice, but the only option. And also that because there is this higher rate of sexual assault uh, that we discussed, that it could impact even further um, this community, which is very, very important. But also remember, we've talked about this before, reproductive justice does not only equal abortion, especially when we look at the history of forced sterilization that particularly impacted women and extra particularly women of color with disabilities. So here's a quote from American Progress. The reproductive rights movement has historically fought for the legal right to abortion. In connection to disability, this has occurred in an environment dense with misinformation and stigma about prenatal diagnoses of disability. Disability selective abortions, which are based on a diagnosis of disability before birth, are fueled in part by eugenics with ableist assumptions about disability and lifespan, quality of life, and the desirability of raising a disabled child, among others. So I think when we talk about intersexual feminism, this is so important. And why this disability pride is important and why we need to have these conversations and why we need to talk about these intersections. Because as we discussed in past episodes and in our book, people with disabilities, which by the way, there is an ongoing conversation of how uh, preferred terminology. So I just want to acknowledge that, but that it is the largest marginalized community in the world that can impact anybody, um, whether it's temporarily or permanently. So I think this is so important to keep in mind these intersectional numbers and keep in mind this history and 
not to involve people who should be involved in conversations, decision-making conversations, because as we know, this is a big election year, not just for the U.S., but for a lot of places. And with everything that's going on, it's really important that we not leave people out of conversations like this that should be the ones leading. So yeah, just wanted to go over some of those statistics because I was I was just curious and I um, there are a lot of resources out there for people who want to to look more into it. And I'm sure, as I said, we'll be coming back and doing more episodes. But uh, for now, we just wanted to kickstart this month with this short Monday mini. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And if you have any thoughts about this or any resources you want to share, if you're uh, from other places in the world and you have thoughts or experiences, uh, please let us know. You can email us at stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff Never Told You. We're also on YouTube. We have a tea public store and we have a book. You can get wherever you get your books. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christine, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And nice to see you for listening. Stuff on Ever Told You's production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 